So we're going to be talking about how we can bring the entrepreneurial mindset and growth model to social change. Um, so the session is going to be called A Playbook for Social Change. And we're really going to be thinking about, you know, how can we, how can we fund social change? Um, and we're bringing on stage Jeff Busgang, who's a general partner at Flybridge Capital Partners. I've met him a lot of times being in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, and he's really a very special and kind person. And he's actually one of the founders of Hack Diversity, so he really cares about what's going on in our city. He is born and raised in Boston, something that we've been asking and talking about a lot in the last two days. Um, and his firm, Flybridge, is actually also the founder of X Factors, um, which is a fund that supports um, companies where there's at least one female founder, which I think, obviously, is super exciting. So big round of applause for Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Following D. Ruff is tough. I won't try to rhyme, because then I'll waste all my time. But before he came on, by the way, I'm even more impressed at the quality of his presentation to you, because just before he came on, every presenter's nightmare happened to him, which is that his cell phone rang, and it was his mom. And you can't not pick that up. So that was really doubly impressive to talk to your mom very quickly, and then get on stage and execute that plan. So. I am going to speak a little bit about civic entrepreneurship and a playbook for social change. So as mentioned, my day job is I'm a venture capitalist and I'm a professor also at Harvard Business School in the entrepreneurship department. I'm not going to speak at all about venture capital and entrepreneurship. I'm only going to speak about something that happened to me maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, which is that I decided to begin dedicating a lot of my time to social impact. And I did it without trying to impact my job. I sort of tried to compartmentalize and do it in my free time and in my personal time. And so the things I'm going to talk about today are in the context of my role as citizen. And when you listen to the stories I'll tell you, Think about your role as citizen, and then we'll come back to whether there might be a thread in there that might inspire you to do something in the context of your job, or perhaps just in the context of a range of activities that you might pursue. And the theme of my talk is a children's story called Stone Soup. Did anybody ever read this book? Awesome. So how does this one go, Linda? Uh, 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 two uh, soldiers show up in a town and they're hungry. They come to them and say they don't have any food. And so they say, we're going to make a stone soup. And, and they ask for ingredients and everything. Yeah, so two soldiers show up in a town and they say, hey, we're, we're really hungry. We want to make stone soup. And the townspeople say, whoa, whoa, whoa. That sounds like a big endeavor, making soup for you guys. You know, we don't have anything to share. They hide the carrots, they hide the celery, they hide all their meat and their potatoes. And so the soldiers take a different approach. They come to the town, they say, actually, we're not going to ask you to be fed. We'll, we'll do the work ourselves. We'll deliver stone soup, and we're just going to put a pot of water and start boiling. And then they go to each of the townspeople individually, and they say, hey, let's not take on this whole thing of feeding the soldiers. All you need to do is bring carrots. Can you just, you one person, could you bring some carrots? And then they go to the next person, they say, can you bring the celery? And the next person, can you bring some spices? And long story short, everybody in the town contributes their one thing, and it results in this amazing meal being prepared that feeds the whole town. So what does this children's story have to do with social change? The connection, hopefully, is pretty obvious. One of the things that I've observed about impacting or taking on a major issue, and you heard the previous speakers talk about the opioid crisis and social justice in our jails and in our justice system, when you take on these huge problems or identify these huge problems, it's very daunting. 
just like showing up and saying, hey, can you feed me and feed all of my fellow soldiers? That is an overwhelming ask. And as citizens, it's even more overwhelming because it's not our day job to solve these big problems. Our day job is whatever we do to get a paycheck and pursue our career, and maybe we can do some small things on the side, but it's really hard to imagine as an individual citizen taking on system-wide change. But in fact, if you take the approach of stone soup, you can imagine impacting systemic issues with individual contributions. And I'll come back to how one might do that. The methodology that I've learned over the years is combining stone soup, the children's parable, with the lean startup theory. So if folks know the methodology that Eric Ries popularized when he published The Lean Startup, which 10 years ago rippled through the startup community, it's a very simple paradigm, which is you identify a big problem, you gather the right people around you to try to solve the problem, you ideate and brainstorm solutions, and then you identify a minimum viable product or an MVP, which you then expose to the market. So rather than wait years to come up with the grand, massive, perfect solution, you simply pick a minimum solution that's viable that you can test. And when you test it, you get feedback. And when you get feedback, you adjust. And over time, you develop the right solution, which you can then scale. The implications in the world of startups has been obvious. And companies from Airbnb to Uber to many others have executed on this methodology to build big companies. The paradigm applied to the social setting is less obvious, but is now beginning to get some traction. And it's the paradigm that I've seen work again and again, which is applying this design thinking and design mentality to these big social problems. So you take the stone soup parable, which is that everyone contributes a little one thing to build the greater scheme. And you take the design thinking and experimentation methodology of the Lean Startup, and you have a pretty powerful cocktail to pursue social change. So I've seen this play out in a couple of examples. One example is in the issue of diversity in tech. In the introduction, you heard that I co-founded this program called Hack Diversity. The way that came about is a few years ago, Bloomberg Business Week had a cover story titled, Why Can't Google, Silicon Valley in general, Google in particular, hire black coders? And it discussed the whole journey that Google had gone through of showing up at the historical black colleges after they'd identified this problem, which is a massive problem for an industry that's supposedly incredibly forward in our products and services. We're incredibly backward in our hiring practices when it comes to diversity and inclusion. So Google said, well, we're a leader. We'll try to get ahead of this. We'll show up at the historically black colleges. We'll do this big recruiting systematic program, and we'll fill our engineering ranks with black and brown engineers. And it turned out to be a total failure. When they tried to pull these people, these individuals, these talented uh, engineers out of the historically black colleges into Silicon Valley, they felt alienated. They felt alone. They felt overwhelmed, they weren't prepared, they weren't embraced, and it was a complete disaster. So I read this article, and I thought, well, surely in Boston we can do better. We have the same problem, but unlike the dynamic that Google was trying to solve of importing people from 3,000 miles away out of Alabama, Georgia, Washington, DC, we have the talent here, we have the companies here, maybe we can do something together. But I didn't know the solution, I just knew the problem. So I convened, thinking about these two notions of stone soup and the lean startup, I convened a group of talented domain experts who were cross-sectoral, so university experts out of Bunker Hill and UMass Boston who were in charge of recruiting, a number of businesses who were in charge of hiring from companies like HubSpot, Vertex, and elsewhere. I think that's... Laura there from HubSpot, I spotted there on the left. Hello, Laura. And 
experts in training from Europe and resilient coders and other venues. And we just grabbed a group of people together and said, OK, here's the problem. We all know this is a problem. We've all been talking about this problem. Can we conceive of a solution? And can all of us come together to contribute a little something to make stone soup? And can we use the lean startup paradigm to just test something? Let's not do a big announcement. Let's not get the governor and the mayor and everybody involved. Like, let's just quietly see if we can develop an MVP. And we did that, and that became Hack Diversity. In our first summer, we created an internship program to get the talent out of the community colleges that were training computer science and engineers, many of whom were black and brown, many of whom were immigrants, but they were struggling to find their way into our best innovation companies. And so we created a training program and a paid internship pathway that not only trained the students, but we also created wraparound services and a mentor network that provided one-to-one -one mentorship with an executive of color from Boston. And then we created a training program for the companies so that they could elevate their capabilities in diversity and inclusion, identify hiring managers who would be diversity champions, and bring the two together. We did it with five companies in the first year, total MVP, we made it up, we had no organization, we had no money, we just went to the companies and said, will you take some interns, here's what we're trying to do, and we went to the schools and said, do you have any bright students who are willing to run this experiment with us? We found five companies, 17 students, and had a blowout for a summer. Last summer, the one that just ended, we doubled to 10 companies and 35 students and had a spectacular second season. And next year, we're planning on 15 companies and 50 students, all of whom are black or brown, meaning Hispanic or African American, study computer science at one of our community colleges or urban schools, otherwise undiscovered talent that we're pumping into these companies and finding great pathways. And I'll give you just a quick story on that. There was one individual who applied blindly to one of our participant companies, I won't say which one, and didn't even receive an interview. They looked at his resume and said, you don't have the right pedigree, you don't have the right network, you didn't come in with a warm introduction from your uncle or your dad, so we're not even going to interview you. He went through Hack Diversity. He landed an internship in that exact company. And at the end of the summer, he received a $100,000 a year job offer. And this is a guy who was waiting tables on maybe some of you in the front office of a Back Bay restaurant two years ago. So that's the transformative opportunity. We've now created an organization. We're now ready for scale. We now have a half a million dollar a year budget that we've raised from the companies and from philanthropy and philanthropic sources. And we're off and running with this program, looking to scale into the marketing sector with the support of HubSpot, looking to scale into life sciences, talent more broadly with the help of Vertex. So again, an idea, stone soup, bringing a lot of people together, everybody contributes something, and then apply the lean startup methodology to execute. I'll give you another example, and that is from the city of Lawrence. Anybody here from Lawrence out of curiosity or grow up in Lawrence or? Yeah. I was here already helping the people that were there. Say it again. I was here already helping the community there for the gas thing. Um, oh, you were involved in the gas crisis, the explosion. I helped a little bit of you know, helping people, but. Um, Fantastic. They need more help than that. They need a lot of help. So the city of Lawrence is emblematic of a lot of industrial cities in America, 30 plus miles away. It's a city of around just under 100,000 people. What people talk about that America is becoming more of an immigrant community and more of a minority majority. Lawrence is at the leading edge of that. The city is 80% Hispanic, majority of whom are from the Dominican Republic, majority of whom are immigrants. So it's a completely minority-driven community. And when you look at the transition, this is a beautiful picture of a, one of their mills. The infrastructure is extraordinary. If you've ever been there, they have these beautiful old mills. It was the center of the Industrial Revolution where they made textiles, clothing, shoes, extraordinarily productive global city that when the information age happened and the industrial revolution ran its course and jobs and factories moved overseas, it completely hollowed out the economy. So the city of Lawrence is now like many US industrial cities in the midst of this transition. And 
I had the good opportunity and good fortune to meet the mayor of the city, who's a very honest, industrial, entrepreneurial public servant named Dan Rivera. And many people pointed me to Lawrence as a community that was ready for transition and transformation. And so I started spending time with some of the leaders there, the mayor and some of the local business and civic leaders. And again, thinking about this social change playbook, Stone Soup and the Lean Startup, I began to convene groups of people who were stakeholders and domain experts in the city and outside of the city to brainstorm of solutions to help the city begin to transform and progress and came to a program design in partnership with the local business leaders called Lawrence Leads, which is an executive education program that we executed and in the, are in the process of executing now, we're about two-thirds of the way through, at Harvard Business School, where we identified the 30 top leaders from the city across sectors, across the business, nonprofit, and civic sectors, and have handcrafted a, an executive education and leadership program where the 30 of them are operating as a cohort to both elevate their game as leaders and also to form a joint community to affect social change. We have been totally making this up as we go along, like the MVP approach. So we didn't have a huge amount of money. We didn't have a top-down approach. It was completely grassroots, very organic. And I went to each of the professors at HBS that are participating and each of the civic leaders in our community. I went to Linda and I said, hey, Stone Soup, can you just bring some carrots? Like, that's all I'm asking for. Just show up, do this one thing, and then together we'll create a really potent mix. It's been an incredibly powerful and successful program. And I'll tell you an interesting story since the gentleman mentioned the Columbia gas explosion that people probably saw in the news, which was a, an extraordinarily horrific incident that happened in the city. And one of the participants in the program is, has his own law practice. He's a Dominican immigrant, Socrates de la Cruz. Socrates grew up in projects in South Lawrence and found his way through law school to become a lawyer and represents a lot of the local businesses and individuals on criminal cases. So Rachel was saying before about, you know, she decides whether to put you in jail or not. If she decides whether to put you in jail or not, Socrates decides whether he's going to help you get out of jail or not or mitigate the sentence. One of the families that was affected by the gas explosion, people probably read about this maybe in the Globe, where the roof collapsed, the, fu the fireplace ex um, landed on a car and killed a uh, young teenager, an 18-year-old, and the family was um, physically scarred and emotionally scarred. That family came to Socrates and said, will you represent us? in a lawsuit against Columbia Gas. And Socrates' instinct, he told me, was, I got to give this to Mintz Levin. I got to give this to Ropes and Gray. I can't handle this. It's too big for me. And then he remembered some of the lessons we had taught him just a few weeks ago at Harvard around service leadership, around marshalling resources, and around stepping up. And he decided to take on the case, which is going to be a transformative case for the community and for himself and his business, because he, he realized that what the family wanted was a local leader. And that notion of the local leadership stepping up and helping itself is an incredibly powerful notion. It's not waiting for outsiders. It's not waiting for some savior from the government or from the state. It's the local leadership coming together in a cross-sectoral fashion. Thomas Friedman in the New York Times wrote a great article about the city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania that some of you may have seen a month or so ago describing how Lancaster was in the process of this similar sort of self-help, self-awareness effort. And I'm beginning to see that in the city of Lawrence in a really powerful way in some part thanks to this program. So the playbook is pretty straightforward as I said. What I've come to is this notion of finding these huge, intractable problems, galvanizing a community of experts and leaders around them, brainstorming solutions, coming up with one that's testable, run an experiment, design an MVP and test that out, very grassroots, very low-key, and then iterate 
and as it works, begin to scale. And just yesterday, David Brooks had a terrific editorial in the New York Times. I had to slam this in this morning with the presentation. That's why the type is a little smaller, because I added this quote. I hope you don't mind. He was talking about another community that had come together and was engaging in social change. And he had this great quote about the playbook they had come to, which rhymes with the playbook that I'm sharing with you, which I've organically come to. Quote, create an informal authority structure that transcends public sector, private sector lines. And I think that's so important because you don't want to get caught up in bureaucracy. You don't want to have the, you know, wait for the mayor, wait for the city council, wait for some board meeting. Like, just go do it at a grassroots level. The grassroots, that rallies the grassroots and the grass tops. So it gets the support from very senior people, but really does it from the, the bottom up. Organize around the data, be extremely data driven, and then bring all the players together. What's amazing in Boston is that we are an, an incredibly collaborative community. I find when I go to people and ask for carrots or celery or bread, they say yes. Unlike the villagers, people in this community say yes very, very frequently. So that's the essence of the playbook. Now, I have to tell you, when I told my wife about this presentation that I was giving and I was getting her feedback on it over the weekend, she told me it was a terrible presentation. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, it's a terrible presentation because what you're saying to the audience is come up with the big solutions and be the leaders and the drivers of these ideas. And that's really intimidating, Jeff. Like, that's overwhelming. Don't ask them for that. All you should ask them is to bring the carrots. So that's my charge to you, is if you're not, if you're not the one that comes up with these solutions, if you say, oh my god, the opioid crisis, like I just heard this incredible panel from the Suffolk incoming DA, and I, I can't even imagine taking that on. But boy, if, if there were some initiative that was working on that problem, I know I could bring my skills. I know web design, maybe. I could bring web design skills. I know PR. I could help them with their PR activities. I know IT. Maybe I could help them set up the infrastructure for communication. Like, whatever it is that you have as your skill, bring that to the table. Find your passion, find your cause, and bring the carrots. Thank you very much. I want to bring lots of carrots up here right now. <laughs> cool. So we have um, time for a Q&A, which I'm really excited about. I would imagine there's a lot of questions in the room. Do we have our mic runner? Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm going to just hang out here because I love to hang out. <laughs> Great. That was wonderful. Tell your wife it was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> uh, I will quote you on that. <laughs> so I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think it takes to be that catalyst? So when you reached out and you had this vision of how to incorporate more diversity into local companies, what do you think it was about you and your delivery that really enabled that convening of people? And then if you could also add a little bit more color about your pitch to those companies, because you, know, you, met, you mentioned that company that already had the opportunity to hire this, this young gentleman and passed. So what was that why like when you spoke with? Yeah, with so him? I think to be a catalyst, I have a personality disorder, which is I'm a little bit obsessive. So when I get on a problem, I get obsessed with that problem. And I think, like many entrepreneurs, when you come to an issue, you just are consumed by it and you're always thinking about it. And that's what a catalyst needs to do, I think. They need to be totally obsessed with the problem. And so if there's a problem, I don't know what that is for you, but if there's a problem that you've been thinking about, that you can't stop thinking about, that you've been reading about, that you talk to your friends about, evenings, dinners, whatever, that's probably a good sign that that's your one thing that you should be pursuing and trying to be a catalyst for. And then that the pitch, in the case of hack diversity, I was a little obnoxious in that I went to the CEOs directly. I didn't go bottoms up to pitch because I said, you've got to get top-down support. This is breakthrough, and it needs to be an executive-level 
visionary cell. And I said, you've got two problems. One problem is your workforce is not at all diverse, and that reflects incredibly poorly on you, and your customers and your employees are noticing. And secondly, you have a talent shortage, and you're in the middle of a talent crisis. And I've got a solution for both of those problems. So it was real ROI. It wasn't a charitable pitch. Jody Rose, my co-founder in Hack Diversity, who is the president of the New England Venture Capital Association, she loves in every pitch about Hack Diversity, she has the same line. She says, this isn't charity. This is business. You've got a talent problem. You've got a competitive advantage problem with respect to diversity. We're going to help you. So it really made it less about, hey, do us a favor, be a good person, pull on your heartstrings. It was very ROI business-like in the pitch. And, and I think, generally speaking, you know, one could think now, oh, it's Jeff, of course, every CEO is going to open your email and like respond to what you have to say. But I think, as we've been hearing over the last two days, I think it's all about just go and ask. Um, and even for me, when I started out of, as an entrepreneur and I you know, didn't have a great you know, success story to point at yet, um, I also often went to like very high level um, and got executive buy-in, and I think this was a theme that's been coming up over the last two days of like, get your support system, get your sponsors, your idea sponsors rallied around you. Um, so I think this is really great advice that anybody should follow. And as my wife pointed out to me, you don't have to be the catalyst. You could, and it'd be amazing if everybody in this room were to walk out of here and be a catalyst. I mean, think about that for a minute. If everyone in this room walked out of here and said, I'm obsessed with the following social issue and I'm going to take it on, that'd be game changing for our city. I mean, just this small group of people would have an extraordinary multiplicative ripple effect. But if even you all just said, I'm going to contribute to someone else's initiative, the DA's initiative, you know, an initiative that Linda's pursuing, an initiative that Laura's pursuing, with the HubSpot team. That would be amazing as well. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah, can we have the mic up front here? Or, uh, we have one more in the back. Go ahead. Uh, earlier today during our breakout session, we were talking about how to fund new organizations that have a profit motive and a social impact as a goal. Um, and from the firm level, uh, what came up was that you can incorporate a B Corp and that in the bylaws and in your charter, you balance profit motive with your goal. Um, and the question we couldn't resolve, or we didn't know at the time, um, and maybe you could answer is, is there something analogous to that when creating a new VC fund? Um, whether it's from a legal perspective uh, within the legal code, or is it something that you can deal with privately? Very few VC funds operate as B Corps. There is one or two that have taken that step. But many VC funds will invest in B Corps if they think they're going to get a high return on investment. There's a whole set of investors that are impact investors that are willing to not only invest in B Corp, but maybe take a slightly lower return in exchange for much higher impact. Bain Capital Ventures, Deval Patrick, and Greg Stewart, for example, created a multi-hundred million dollar impact fund so there are, there are different models that people are implementing there that can be really powerful. I should say Hack Diversity, we ended up as a nonprofit. And I was pitching a philanthropist just last week. Jody and I were pitching a philanthropist. And she said, why do you need philanthropy? Businesses should pay for this. This should be totally self-funded. And we said, yeah, but the school system doesn't, isn't designed. Like, we have a system problem. The system. Our education system isn't producing job-ready individuals that look in the following way. And our companies that are young entrepreneurial companies don't have the resources to train those individuals and bridge that gap. So we have a market failure. We can get the companies to fund two-thirds of it, which is what the budget looks like. But we need philanthropy to cover the following third. So it's a little bit of a hybrid model, what you might call a you know, shared services or corporate services nonprofit model. And many, many organizations are pursuing that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking, it's, it's really interesting to see, to your point earlier, though, right, it's business. You were saying, you know, you want to go in pitching for an ROI, which I think is very true. 
but then as soon as it combines it with social impact, it sometimes gets very fluid of like, oh, are you an NGO? Are you for profit? Um, when I started my company, I remember in the BNL lab, Joey was asking me like, why don't you do an NGO? And then I was like, okay, well, but we're a for-profit business. And I think there is, it, it's a good and important question to ask yourself also what, what you as an entrepreneur want to achieve or, or want out of it or, or what kind of role you want to, to play a, along, along I, the lines. Before I was a VC, I co-founded this company, You Promise, which helped families save money for college. And we had a for-profit business model. We raised over $100 million and built a, a big platform. And I remember people saying to me, why are you a for-profit versus a not-for-profit? And my chief marketing officer used to have a great line. He came out of the advertising industry and he said, you know, in the for-profit agency world in Madison Avenue, you have the most brilliant people in the world spending all their time thinking about how they can sell Kleenex. And in the nonprofit world, you have people trying to save the world who you wouldn't trust with selling Kleenex. So, so if you really want to get amazing talent attracted to your initiative, the for-profit model can sometimes be that much more compelling. That yeah. was a crass metaphor he would use, but I share it anyway. It's true. Linda, go ahead. Um, so thank you so much. This has been a great presentation, and you are a really unique and special civic leader. There are two other stone soups that you've helped make that I'd love for you to touch on. One is um, your fund for women's companies, and the second is Hub Week. <laughs> so the fund for female entrepreneurs, which is called X Factor Ventures, which was mentioned briefly in the introduction, we, we saw two issues in the market, again, a market failure. One, female entrepreneurs, like two of the uh, great examples here in this room, were struggling to get funded at the very pre-seed or seed stage in particular when it was just the individual and their story as opposed to the numbers. Once you get into the Series A, Series B, and you have the numbers, it was more of a free or fair market. But in the pre-seed, seed stage, pedigree and history and networks were colluding to result in poor female funding um, dollar uh, on a dollar basis dynamics. And secondly, there weren't very many female VCs. How do you get more female founders funded? You have more female VCs, but to become a female VC, you need to have built a successful company, exited it, made a lot of money, and then be able to become a VC and get hired. Yeah, it <laughs> sounds so easy. So what we did is we decided we would try to affect both elements of that market failure with creating X Factor Ventures, which was to create a network of very successful female entrepreneurs who were still running and building their companies, so they hadn't had the exit and they weren't yet at that stage where they could be writing checks, form a fund that we raised and then have our team help create that team and support that team with our resources and our history and market knowledge to form an investment team to back female founders at the pre-seed and seed stage. And so that's what we did with X Factor Ventures. The first fund, you think, that sounds like an amazingly um, huge problem. How big was your first fund? It was $3 million. And there was a female CEO in the Boston market who was quoted when we announced the fund. We sort of did a quiet announcement. And her quote was, be still my heart, like $3 million. Like, really? That's your answer? And, we, and she's a terrific executive, and I don't begrudge her statement because she's right, but we did the MVP. We said, let's start low-key. This is test and learn. We have no idea if this is going to work. We've deployed two-thirds of that fund. It's been spectacularly successful by any measure, and we're in the process very quietly, so I probably shouldn't say, but we're starting to talk about raising a second fund, which will be meaningfully larger, having now the proof point. So that's the X Factor Venture story. The Hub Week story is a fellow venture capitalist and I and a Boston Globe editorial page um, editor were talking about how lame it was that Austin was the center of South by Southwest and Boston had nothing. And here we have Harvard and MIT and all these amazing institutions and people are going to Austin? Like that doesn't make any sense. So we started talking about it and again, it's sort of a stern soup, you know, big problem. We have no idea how to solve that problem. We tried to convene a bunch of people and it was pretty obvious that we all had no ability to execute on anything close to what the solution might need to look like so we thought, well, who's the one person in Boston who has the power, the vision, the resources, and the network to execute on this idea? And we came to Linda. And Linda and I had never met. 
Linda didn't know me from Adam. I don't know why you took the meeting in the first place. I think it was because the Boston Globe editor said, take this meeting with these two random venture capitalists who you thought were a little kooky. We showed up probably in jeans and, right? And yeah, our, yeah, our vests, right, our Patagonia vests, okay. typical VC yep. um, attire. And Linda said, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Why are you telling me this? And we said, well, because we want you to run it because you're the perfect person. And somehow Linda was compelled and Hub Week was created under her vision and extraordinary work and now we're in year four. I think that is actually, yeah, I was going to say a big round of applause. Yeah. Um, I was at Hub Week for first year um, and, I, and I really love what we're building and not, I'm purposely not saying what we've built, right, because it's a, it's a process of, of, of change and it's been changing every year. Um, this year we had for the first time the Changemaker Conference with all of you here. We've been really getting to know each other really intimately over the last two days, which has been amazing. We've had amazing speakers. You're actually gonna be the one closing it out for today. So we're so excited that you shared your story. I think it's tying a lot of themes together that we've been having over the last couple of days. Um, and I think, you know, to your point, not everybody needs to be a catalyst, but I, I do think we have a very uh, big group of, of catalysts here. Um, so why don't we give a big round of applause, say thank you to Jeff. Thank you. Cool, and I think uh, we're gonna close it up with that, and we're gonna have a breakout session now that we're gonna introduce, but thank you so much. Awesome, pleasure, cool. thank you. Thank you.